طابة صباح الخير. سأنقول لك My name is Hani Awad and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today on behalf of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in its fifth international winter school. That many of you have traveled long distances to be here is a reminder to us all just how important our work is. We are delighted to have you with us. Before I introduce you to our first lecture in this program, please allow me to give you a very brief background on the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the International Winter School. Since its foundation in 2010, the Arab Center has been drawing on top regional scholars to provide in-depth analysis and to promote research-based approaches to understanding issues of society and the state of the Arab world. Uh, it established itself as a, uh, as a leading research center in the region, a uh, focal point for Arab academics, and it dedicated itself to the values of democracy, egalitarianism, and encountering essentialist views of the region, all through scientific research. The Arab Center has three branches in Tunis, Washington, and Paris. It founded both the Doha Historical Dictionary of Arabic and the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, it has many units and programs, among them uh, the Unit of State and Political System Studies, uh, the Iranian Studies Unit, the Strategic Studies Unit, uh, the Arab Opinion Index, uh, the Palestinian National Movement Project, and the Gulf Studies Unit. The, the center also publishes seven peer-reviewed journals, uh, Umran for Social Sciences, Tabayun for Philosophical Studies and Critical Theories, Ustur for Historical Studies, Hikama for Public Administration and Public Policy, Siasat for Political Science and International Relations, and al Muntaqa for Arab Studies, which is published in English, al Muntaqa. The center also organizes dozens of conferences, symposiums on yearly basis, and this international winter school is only one of them. The international school, uh, the international winter school, is an annual program that seeks to provide an in-depth and critical look at selected topics. It provides an opportunity for participants uh, to network with international and regional academics, gain substantive knowledge, and receive feedback from respected scholars. Since since its launch in 2020. The Winter School has re received hundreds of applications from all over the world. The theme of the first Winter School in 2020 was on communitarianism, sectarianism, and the state. The second round in 2021 was under the title of the state in flux. Uh, the third one in, uh, in, uh, 20 tw was on populism in 2022 variations in populism, and the fourth round last year was under the title of Political Culture Revisited, How Values Drive Politics. As you already know, the topic of the fifth International Winter School is social media, surveillance, and societies of control. It addresses the interaction between uh, social media surveillance by governments and corporations and the vulnerability of popular culture to manipulation and control through social media. Moreover, the recent uh, genocidal Israeli war on Gaza and the Palestinian people raised more questions on the way how social media has been uh, increasingly politicized. Uh, since the early days of the war, misinformation has been widespread and misinformation has been widespread in the Israeli war on Gaza with dissemination of false misleading information and content has, that has gone viral in nature. Tens of millions of posts in circulation in social media have been widely distributed to distort the public's perception of the Israeli genocide taking place in Gaza. Some misinformation actually has been widely distributed in mainstream media and repeated by head of state, including the president of the United States. As such, the objective of this year Winter School is to provide an in-depth and critical reading of studies written by academic experts on both social media and surveillance. Participants 
will have the chance to present and receive feedback on their research papers in dedicated sessions looking at social media and surveillance in different regions in relation to a variety of social and political issues. The research projects uh, this year reflect on data collected in the United States, Egypt, Egypt, Iran, India, Saudi Arabia, Palestine, and Nigeria, among other countries. The diverse nature of empirical work to be presented alongside the theoretical focus of the lectures and the tools provided in specialized workshops will provide a unique opportunity to enrich our understanding of this year's topic. Again, I would like to welcome you all to this program. I hope you enjoy Doha's winter life, especially through the different social activities we encourage you to join. And now I believe it's about time just to introduce our first lecturer. Our first lecturer in this program is uh, Dr. David Lohan. Dr. David Lohan, who will deliver uh, a lecture under a uh, title of Popular Metaphors for Surveillance and Why They Matter. Before I give uh, the floor to Dr. David, uh, allow me just to introduce at the University of a student box to 18 languages and articles starting with electronic, the electronic eye, 1994, and most recently pandemic surveillance published in 2022. He had he has led several large collective research projects in surveillance with research funding total almost 8 million. His work being recognized in Canada, Switzerland, the US, the UK with a number of fellowship prizes, awards and honorary doctorate. He is the co-editor with Ilya Zurek and Yasmin Abulaban of surveillance and control in Israel, Palestine. Ilya Zurek and the Palestinian the Palestinians, Ilya Zurek's sociological and critical contribution to Palestinian surveillance, to Palestinians and surveillance studies, and Ahmed Saadi and Noor Masalha edited volume. Please all welcome, uh, join me to welcome uh, Dr. David. Dr. Thank you very much for your kind welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I feel very privileged to be here, in fact. Uh, it's quite an honor for me to be here. I'm just a uh, white Westerner, a male, and uh, yeah, I, I feel very privileged. This is uh, not the first time I have been at the Institute. I was at the Institute a number of years ago, and at the time there was just one building. And uh, whichever direction you looked out of the window from that building, it was just sand. And I come here now and I find there are palm trees and all kinds of uh, life around the one building that used to be. And uh, so it's really quite exciting for me to revisit and discover uh, just how much things have changed here at uh, the Institute. Uh, I was heartened too by seeing the um, Palestinian flags in the uh, entryway and uh, it had seemed to me ever since October the 7th that uh, we could not but discuss what was happening uh, in terms of the uh, winter school uh, main topics because they are so relevant to what is happening in, uh, in Gaza. Um, my wife and I are very happy to uh, support a number of organizations that are committed to uh, reconciliation, to finding new uh, ways forward for that uh, piece of land. 
and uh, so I'm very happy to be here on several different accounts. Um, as I speak, I'm going to be referring to uh, matters that relate to our overall theme, uh, but in a fairly general way, just because clearly from reading the uh, background of uh, students and uh, faculty who are here, we are from a, a wide range of areas. Um, so I shall try to comment on the main themes, but uh, from my particular perspective, which is primarily to do with surveillance, uh, clearly social media is uh, important in that, and uh, societies of control also important. Uh, but surveillance is where I come in to uh, what we are discussing together. Uh, and. Please, if I speak too fast, then just raise your hand and ask me to slow down. Um, I will try to comply. Um, again, I feel um, honor-bound to do so when uh, I am speaking a minority language. A brief biographical note just to continue what uh, was said in the kind introduction. I've spent the last almost four years uh, studying surveillance in the modern world. Uh, I think of myself as a critical historical sociologist. My first book, as was mentioned, uh, came out in 94, and it was called The Electronic Eye, The Rise of Surveillance Society. I sent it to the publisher as the rise of surveillance society without the electronic eye part because I thought of it as an historical piece, as an historical sociological piece. Um, but of course the publisher had different ideas about uh, what the title should be. But it was limited to surveillance in the modern era and coming into a hypermodern era. Uh, and in the past 10 years particularly, I've been thinking increasingly about the longer history, uh, early modern, Renaissance, medieval, and uh, ancient uh, histories of, so, uh, of surveillance. And so that's part of the background of uh, what you hear this morning. Um, okay. A couple of uh, opening questions just so that we're on the same page. I think a lot of people who are here arrived um, by air. I did last night. As you came to the passport control in the uh, Doha airport, what did you notice in passport control? What I noticed was an emphasis on digital data, a document that uh, I have carried for decades, the passport, was not being read as a document. In fact, the person that I was with seemed to have very little interest in reading the document of the passport. The important thing was putting it through the scanner because it's an electronic document, primarily, whereas it used to be something that you read and checked as you had someone in front of you. And so um, th that was one aspect of it. The other was having um, obtained a visa for visiting Qatar, there was absolutely no interest in seeing it. I offered the visa, but was refused. It didn't seem to be of any interest. What was of interest was ensuring that they had four finger biometrics and a facial scan. And so what was once primarily a documentary, and really only for the last hundred years, uh, the passport, it is no longer a document in the old sense. It's entirely an electronic process. So I don't know if you noticed that, but of course, 
I did. And uh, I found it very interesting to be confronted with someone who was totally uninterested in the old way in which a passport might be used and in the production of other documents that were obviously of no interest to that person. And another question for you, well, this is a question for you. Um, can you just tell me if you know the term black mirror? Yeah, I see some nods. Okay, so there are some people who know black mirror. It's an interesting metaphor, and uh, I think it's quite an important one. Anyway, we'll come to that. Metaphors are, uh, metaphors for surveillance are words that um, are used in everyday life. In the Western world, particularly, people refer to Big Brother, for example, Panopticon, Eye of God, and sometimes Black Mirror. They all refer to surveillance in some way, and uh, Black Mirror is, is an interesting one because it goes far beyond surveillance, but it depends upon surveillance. Historically, the notion of the eye of God is the oldest idea, followed by the panopticon. And then lastly, Big Brother, unless you also count, uh, Black Mirror. In the West, Big Brother is by far the most common uh, metaphor for surveillance and, uh, and has been since the middle of the 20th century, following the publication of George Orwell's novel, 1984 came out in 1949. And it, it has a, a, a theoretical resonance too. And that theoretical resonance is with the approach of uh, sociologist Max Weber. But in this case refers only to the risks, not the benefits of bureaucratic government. Because Max Weber wrote about uh, both the benefits and the risks of bureaucratic forms of governance. And that was Orwell's theme, too. And so, really, Orwell was referring to what we might call the information state seen in population and uh, citizen data collection and use. The panopticon was, well, Jeremy Bentham's idea, perhaps, uh, although it bears strong resemblance to ideas that were produced 250 years before Bentham. Thomas More's Utopia has a very similar uh, notion in it from 1516. Bentham's was, uh, what, 1793. And Panopticon really only became significant as a concept that would make you think of surveillance uh, because of the work of Michel Foucault. And so there's the theoretical uh, connection with Panopticon that uh, might otherwise have just been lost in the uh, mists of history if it hadn't been for Foucault. So, that too relates to surveillance theory. The metaphor has a connection with surveillance theory. Now, I've noticed that the eye of God idea is appearing with increasing frequency. Now, I haven't checked that empirically, but it does seem to me that from uh, doing the work in surveillance that I do, that the idea of the eye of God is often used uh, today. Uh, it may re relate, uh, w w when drones started to be used, uh, the eye of God was often a term that was uh, associated with that. And of course, then it would refer to remote assassination and such 
ugly matters, to algorithms, to AI, uh, and, and other kinds of control mechanisms. Um, interestingly, Shoshana Zuboff uh, makes most use of the eye of God in her uh, book on surveillance capitalism, uh, but she is referring to uh, the production of a technology of surveillance uh, at MIT in, uh, in the US. So the eye of God is used in a way that speaks of uh, comprehensive and controlling or coercive forms of surveillance. There's a strong notion of coercive power frequently in the way that that term is used today, and therefore is highly critical of surveillance. Uh, though in earlier centuries, the eye of God idea was much more ambivalent. Um, care as much as control was evident. Uh, and of, of course, in medieval times, the sovereign individual was not, uh, didn't exist, uh, as it does in contemporary liberal theories. And surveillance was both through the state and religious authorities, as well as uh, being local and interpersonal. In, in medieval times, the uh, eye of God was not exclusively negative at all. Far from it, it had a dual character, uh, eliciting both reassurance uh, that God was actually watching over uh, human situations and respect because uh, God was concerned with justice and with peace. So debates over surveillance make use of all kinds of uh, metaphors and they're frequently connected with theoretical concepts. It's ironic but uh, perhaps not surprising uh, at a time when more and more uh, users of digital devices are aware of the constant collection analysis and uses of their data. And as I say, the notion of black mirror uh, refers very much to surveillance capitalism. In fact, out of those four metaphors, black mirror refers much more strongly to the 21st century versions of surveillance than any of the other three do. And of course, that's because it refers to a world where not just the state and uh, policing functions and security functions are paramount, but rather that um, corporations are uh, directly involved in surveillance which again today is a hugely important feature of what we're thinking about. So surveillance speaks to a whole variety of phenomena today. Social media is profoundly uh, but ambiguous implicated in this process as surveillance cultures continue to uh, evolve. So let me uh, try to explore these a little bit more uh, deeply. How do we compare and contrast notions like Big Brother, uh, Panopticon, Eye of God, um, Black Mirror? And how do we acknowledge that these are an important part of contemporary uh, surveillance cultures? By surveillance culture, I mean ways of living. So I, I think of uh, watching as a way of life that has become much more significant in particular ways in the 21st century. And it's associated with the realities of everyday surveillance. They vary considerably, uh, but the cultures of surveillance involve both what I call, uh, following Charles Taylor, uh, imaginaries, so surveillance imaginaries, how we uh, imagine the situation of surveillance that confronts us in today's world. And on the other hand, 
uh, surveillance um, practices. That is how we actually go on knowing that there are new kinds of surveillance that are surrounding us, especially as we interact with digital media. So cultures of surveillance, ways of living in surveillance situations, exhibiting both imaginaries and practices which then inform each other. 1984, that features the Big Brother idea, may be seen dourly as a dreaded dystopia, or as an inspiring challenge to resistance. Both are possible as responses to the uh, Big Brother idea. Other novels pick up similar ideas. Uh, I'm a Canadian. Margaret Atwood in um, A Handmaid's Tale, another novel, uh, came out a long time ago, 1985, uh, is now, as you may well know, popularized as a TV series. Um, when we come to the Panopticon, Foucault's uh, version of the Panopticon, Foucault saw it as a turning point in the history of uh, discipline and of surveillance in general. But its usefulness is widely debated among those who are studying uh, surveillance. Some see it as a uh, fearsome automation of surveillance, contemporary panopticons. Uh, but for Foucault, of course, it was also something that was productive. So there are um, alternative ways of thinking. Uh, Foucault, of course, thought they were complementary. Um, but that's another aspect of our thinking about these metaphors. As for the eye of God metaphor, uh, it's taken for granted menace is seldom examined in an historical, uh, in any historical detail. And as I say, Black Mirror is a TV series based metaphor, appropriate, very appropriate to the 21st century. Uh, to think of as surveillance, as I've hinted, appears in several contexts. Um, the Handmaid's Tale features secret police, and what are they called? God's eyes. Uh, if you like uh, fantasy literature, then uh, Tolkien's uh, 1955 epic, Lord of the Rings, also epic in the uh, movie department, is the Eye of Sauron. And uh, the, the background to that is also a fascinating one. But Bentham's Panopticon writings from 1793 also have an eye of God idea right there in them. In his own uh, diagram of the Panopticon prison, he had a, um, a little phrase taken from the Christian Bible that was directly related to the eye of God. Well, we, we could go on uh, thinking about those dimensions of these metaphors. Uh, the Black Mirror, interestingly, is, as far as I can tell, entirely dark, terrifying, scary. Some people, including the woman that I've been married to for the last 52 years, will not watch that show. It's too much for her, and often it's too much for me too. How are we doing for time? Yeah, okay. Post 9 11 developments, plus social media and the rise of surveillance capitalism, seem, if anything, to have revived interest in that eye of God idea due to the unseen and apparently all-knowing surveillance enabled by the digital. 
But as I mentioned in relation to uh, Shoshana Zuboff, this is frequently picked up first by the very producers of those technologies. And so it's a, it's a Harvard computer scientist, sorry, a MIT computer scientist who names the system that he has created as an eye of God. It isn't something perceived as the eye of God by those who are at the, uh, as it were, receiving end of that uh, technology. And of course, there are many uh, tropes around the world. I've only been referring to what might be thought of as medieval Christian notions of the eye of God. And of course, the eye of God exists in many uh, languages and in many other uh, locations. Uh, those ojos de Dios in um, Mexican indigenous cultures, for example, uh, in Islam, the uh, Dajjal figure um, suggesting a one-eyed spiritual blindness. Uh, in Sikhism, uh, well, th there are elements in other uh, cultural backgrounds of the Eye of God notion, although in what I've been researching, I found very little that relates directly to surveillance themes out of that, unlike the Western version. In fact, now I'm in such a happily multicultural context, if you have uh, suggestions for my research about uh, the eye of God in your tradition, I'd be very happy to hear it. So there's a little plug uh, for a conversation uh, during this week. Histories of surveillance tend to cluster in the modern or, or hypermodern era. No doubt for the obvious reason that uh, surveillance became important socially and politically in new ways um, as well as technologically from the later 20th century. Um, but as I say, while I for many years was interested in the modern history only or almost only, of surveillance. I'm now far more interested uh, in trying to trace back some of the developments that I now see are connected with contemporary forms of surveillance and responses to them. And we could still talk more about uh, Big Brother uh, and, uh, and so on in, uh, in what I have to say. Um, Big Brother keeps reappearing every time there is some, or at least in the Western media, um, every time there is some uh, new dimension or new scandal about uh, surveillance. One thinks, for example, of the revelations of Edward Snowden in uh, 2013, uh, the National Security Agency in uh, the U.S., was uh, shown to be keeping tabs on American citizens and not just non-American citizens, which was their brief. But it also happens uh, in, in other countries as well. There's a new book by uh, uh, Monu Monori Yawa and Mare on uh, Southern African countries where Big Brother themes are being uh, brought in. That book just came out uh, last year. Um, and, uh, and indeed, um, coercive and divisive uh, state uses of surveillance are also visible in uh, situations like uh, Israel-Palestine. Let me just continue to elaborate uh, on the metaphors in relation to theory. The idea of societies of control, which does come in our uh, theme for this week's winter school, represents Deleuze, uh, Gilles Deleuze's attempt to go beyond Foucault and to provide a, provide a power theory of surveillance related to later 20th century societies.
when electronic technologies were just starting to be referred to as digital. This isn't an attempt to find the source of surveillance in new technologies, far from it, but rather to show that in many different ways governing does take different shape in late 20th and early 20th century uh, societies. For one thing, the neoliberal economic practices that emerged in that period meant that governing depends increasingly on new relations, notably public-private uh, partnerships and collusion, connecting in new ways the state and the economy. And that is critical for what we experience in the 21st century. The highly volatile model of the corporation, with, it, with its constant quest for profitable opportunities, produced a new malleability of what we might call control that was to affect other areas of social and political life. The market thus became far more significant than previously for the very way in which society is organized and uh, how within that surveillance practices are mobilized. At the same time, corporate methods of operation were increasingly visible within the state, further confusing the state-focused term Big Brother. Now, the individual, another uh, important concept within this field, was also important for Foucault. Uh, dependent as it was on the idea that, for him, each person responded to the pan panoptic or other governmentality mechanisms. For Deleuze, however, that notion of the human individual was contracted and uh, the focus on the individual was reduced to a focus, he said, on individuals. In other words, not the fully fledged human person, but something uh, narrowed down, contracted. Mutable entities uh, responding in various ways to the control devices of the present. Uh, Deleuze talked about uh, people being targeted by code as representations, not as human individuals. Control, he suggested, is an abstract process that may be linked together, but according to new logics. And most obviously, this can be seen in the way that uh, some corporations now morph into platform companies. They didn't exist in Deleuze's time. And they can create composite uh, entities from fragments of data comprised of consumer preferences and other details using those data profiles to nudge or influence people through their devices, predominantly today in the 21st century, their phones. And this then, of course, makes the black mirror uh, metaphor more apposite. Each of the two metaphors that uh, have mainly been used, Big Brother and Panopticon, uh, are very modern. And uh, thus they focus on something that may be narrow in terms of its previous uh, vision and also its future vision. Because if you focus on the present, you see less of what brought the present into being. Simultaneously, you may not be ready for what might be emerging from there. I want to point out something else. Surveillance is an ambiguously optical concept. It's ambiguously optical. Surveillance, of course, is a, uh, from the French word, sur, over or above, veillance. And so you have uh, surveillance, which is uh, to say watching over. But now, of course, that is used for all manner of things that go far beyond literal watching. And we can discuss how those might be 
connected. And Foucault was, was well of, aware of this too. Uh, today's surveillance includes listening. Well, that's happened for a very long time. Reading documents, like I was mentioning, the, the passport. Uh, and of course today, biometric traces and many other things. The visual is still very present today, now enhanced by features such as facial recognition, uh, very con controversial in many contexts, especially for policing. In fact, several uh, American municipalities banned the use of facial recognition uh, between 2018 and 2020, especially after some police departments uh, signed on with the company Clearview AI, whose commercial databases of uh, visual, uh, 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 facial images um, provided a massive trove of images. Much evidence has been found of the um, intersectional disadvantages rendered by especially commercial facial recognition systems, where the accuracy of classification is systematically reduced for darker skinned and female subjects. Also, uh, what is called live facial recognition has been shown to be a very dubious way of obtaining accurate and uh, a very interesting and explosive report by researchers in the UK on the London Metropolitan Police use of live facial recognition, that is, on, um, on the beat, as it were, uh, racial, facial recognition uh, has shown to be, uh, have very limited accuracy. And of course, facial recognition technology uh, is very heavily used in uh, settler colonial control in the West Bank. This case called Red Wolf is used at uh, military check and in occupied East Jerusalem. Scanning Palestinian faces without the movement in areas where illegal Israeli settlements exist. The evidence shows that red wolf is used in conjunction with two other wolves, wolf pack, image database, and the latter is Israeli forces to pull up data on Palestinian uh, people on their phones or their tablets. So it's very like live facial recognition uh, using red, blue, uh, wolf, and uh, wolf pack. But in the same way, the ways in which we are seen by surveillance today are manifold. While Foucault-style uh, disciplinary power often relied on the actual visibility is a visibility of those within the gaze, the office manager, the prison guard, factory foreman, and so on. Today, the gaze of ubiquitous street cameras, uh, what Deleuze thinks of as control, relies on other means. The codes that are now developed um, use algorithms to make people visible to companies, institutions, agencies, and the like. So. We've moved, as it were, from having surveillance, watching over, being something that is direct and unmediated, to it being mediated today by electronic, by digital uh, media. But the idea is still that surveillance makes people visible. Or, in the words of uh, John Scott's work, um, he has a book called Seeing Like a State. And John Scott's book shows how governments make people visible. Uh, he uses the word legible. So people are made legible. 
they are seeable, they are visible uh, through surveillance techniques. And so people become readable, as it were, and can then be grouped and classified to make them more governable. Uh, governable. But in the 21st century, rapidly te rapid technologically enabled changes help to alter the conditions of such legibility. When Scott was writing about um, legibility in this sense in the 20th century, he was um, he still allowed for a reciprocal arrangement, uh, a re reciprocal relationship between those who were under surveillance being made visible and uh, those who are, were uh, controlling the um, form of surveillance. In Scott's work, the door is still open for feedback and representation even for protest and regulation. But this is far less the case with what is often called big data, in which large corporate entities, such as uh, Alphabet Google or Meta Facebook, use their systems to gather and analyze data previously unavailable, for instance, to governments. And this changes the relationship as corporate data holders become dominant players in making persons and populations visible in circumstances where very few, if any, responsibilities for reciprocity between the surveilled and the surveillor exist. And of course, because they're corporations, may well be resisted by those corporations. An obvious example, uh, recently, um, during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, is the way in which privately gathered population data may be used by governments during pandemic. It happened in Canada. Um, unknown to the general population, the Public Health Agency of Canada bought location data from a telecom provider, TELUS, presumably to improve the tracing of virus routes in the population. Equally, private data are used by police. Amazon Ring doorbell system, for instance, produces data that is used by police in what is now, according to Lauren Bridges, the largest private surveillance system in the world. While this applies in so-called global north societies, its negative impact may well be even greater in some global south situations. And uh, at some point, I'll share with you the uh, references for these things. The corporate entities are often referred to, as I say, as platform companies within which social media plays a large but not uh, the only role. So does geolocation tracking through phones in which corporations uh, commonly collect massive amounts of data on ordinary users. Let me give you the example, another Canadian example. I guess I should apologize for that, but they're the ones with which I'm most familiar. Uh, an Ottawa s citizen called um, James McLeod discovered just how much when he um, began to suspect that his Tim Hortons mobile ordering app, Tim Hortons, for those of you who don't know, is an American-owned uh, coffee shop that uh, predominates in Canada. The mobile ordering app uh, gives you the chance to be sure that your order is in before you arrive at the uh, coffee shop so that it's ready to take away immediately. Uh, and he suspected the ordering app was doing more than just ensuring that his breakfast uh, coffee was ready for pickup on his way to work. And he made a freedom of information request when he began to suspect this through the uh, Office of the Privacy Commissioner in Canada. 
and it revealed that his workplace was known to Tim Hortons, uh, along with his girlfriend's address. Uh, Tim Hortons knew when he attended sports uh, meets, for example, uh, in, in a different city from where he was living when he went to uh, Toronto to uh, see a Blue Jays game. Um, and when he traveled, when he was on vacation, uh, one example that he got from the Freedom of Information request was when he took a trip to Morocco and he went through Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. It knew that it had been, he'd been through Schiphol and it also knew when he was close to a different coffee provider in uh, Marrakesh in Morocco. Such commercial data, as was gathered by Tim Hortons or the American company that owns them, may be obtained by police, immigration departments, or health services, as I already mentioned. And notice, if we're thinking about the metaphors, that the concerns that James McLeod had were big brother kinds of uh, worries. Why should they know about my personal life, my movements, my contacts? No concerns in what he wrote about it, um, about his, how his life might be impacted by the scoring and ranking that is done on his data. It was, he was kind of using the wrong metaphor, as I understand it, for what he was uh, observing in the results from his Freedom of Information request. Such geolocation has become a major business in its own right. And many companies also sell their services, uh, as it were, life dossiers in a highly dubious grey surveillance market. A recent Citizen Lab report shows how Saudi Arabian visitors to the USA are frequently tracked, probably by their government, using such techniques. And these software systems can be used to track human rights defenders government officials, uh, military leaders, business executives, you name it. They are also very prevalent in Global South countries as well as in the North. So while there may, may no longer be a literal or even a technological eye in the ways in which people and populations are made visible, um, this makes more e urgent the need for guidance as to how the metaphorical eye should operate. Now just a few more comments on uh, how these might relate to um, the challenge of surveillance today in relation to our overall um, uh, winter school theme. Cultures of surveillance that I mentioned earlier are emerging in many countries, which among in which, among other things, surveillance is recognized as a daily experience within digital uh, environments. And this is as true of uh, China or Turkey as it is of Brazil or India, which raises further profound questions about the usefulness of the metaphors that are still in common use. It's not merely that Big Brother states are indeed surveilling persons and populations, uh, and frequently going beyond their legal mandates in quite unaccountable ways. It's that everyone is involved as a witting or an unwitting participant in that surveillance in ways that were not previously true of earlier forms of surveillance. How do those who wish to make a difference in this emerging environment, how are they going to operate? The 20th century question was how to regulate new technologies of surveillance. And much useful work has been done along those lines, especially in the European Union, in my view. But one of the key concepts guiding such activity in North America and elsewhere is privacy, understood in Western liberal terms. 
in which the individual self, so-called, is supreme. But this kind of privacy hardly works in a world of what Deleuze called individuals, where persons are ar uh, algorithmically represented and made visible to corporations and government departments as representations relating to groups of people rather than individuals. If regulation is going to be realistic, it must recognize this basic fact of today's surveillance. We are understood not in liberal individual terms by digital surveillance, but in terms of those with whom we are associated by the system that is surveilling us. Digital technology dependent societies in the 21st century found themselves not only influenced by some very powerful corporations, global corporations operating in concert and in tension with nation states. It's also enabled the growth of numerous movements and initiatives representing civil society, whose activities depend on all online situations. Back to social media. Um, for those of you who are interested in the work of my former colleague, uh, Iluric, uh, Ilya Zurich, uh, he was exploring earlier versions of this in his work on Israel-Palestine, referring to the what he called the hybridity between agency and communication technologies, creating co-agency across once were uh, across once were uh, time-space boundaries. And despite disappointments uh, with once hopeful Arab Spring movements, these activities persist and indeed were prompted again by the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Last, some last comments. Such activities need new vocabularies if we're going to understand them appropriately and if we're going to speak to broad audiences and not just to groups of people who are academics. In other words, we need appropriate metaphors as well as the good theories that are behind them. All too often, metaphors for surveillance speak only to negative, overbearing, carceral, or exploitative dimensions of contemporary surveillance, which is understandable, of course especially for those who are the usual suspects of intersectional vulnerability, including those living in settler colonial circumstances. But if contemporary surveillance is thought of as the processes by which people and populations are made visible, analyzed, and treated, which is how I think of it, then this allows for the introduction of concepts such as data justice, as discussed by a number of people very fruitfully uh, in my view, or algorithmic justice developed by uh, someone like Joy Bualamwini. And this ties in also with concepts like digital, uh, digital citizenship. Again, a concept that I think is under-examined uh, but which is highly appropriate to 21st century versions of, uh, of our understanding of surveillance. I'm thinking of work, for example, by um, Evelyn Ruppert and uh, Engen Ischen. And so this constitutes a plea, not only for fresh modes of analysis of surveillance in the context of datification in the 21st century, with its multiple implications for surveillance. These fresh modes of analysis also need to recognize the everyday life dimensions of surveillance in which users are immersed in a world of digital technologies. And this means trying to navigate towards futures uh, in which three processes need, in my view, to be enhanced. And so now I'm speaking about how I see uh, what I've been saying as having relevance directly to our situation. What are those three processes? This is what I'll leave you with. One, 
to understand the complexity and the actual workings of surveillance in its many forms in the context of social media, among other things, but also more broadly in surveillance or platform capitalism. Two, to develop practical tools for collaborating with others in civil society through bodies committed to regulation practices, technology companies and universities to minimize the negative effects of surveillance. In other words, the ones that erase freedom, that erase fairness. And three, to cooperate with others in developing appropriate modes of doing necessary surveillance, where surveillance can be seen to have beneficial consequences for care, protection, social order, and so on, in the cause of human flourishing. And that's where we need deeper theoretical understanding, but also metaphors so that we can discuss these things more meaningfully with much wider and broader populations. So those are the three processes that I want to leave you with. Thank you, Shukran. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much. Informative, thought-provoking, and insightful. Uh, now we'll open the floor for Q and A. We have uh, like uh, almost 20 minutes, so uh, please, uh, uh, please just, uh, introduce yourself before. Uh, uh, please just click the button. Oh, oh yes, thank you. My, my name is Mohammed Ibrahim. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. First one, uh, about your uh, conception or definition of uh, surveillance uh, concept or culture. And the second question is about uh, your uh, recommendations of your. So my question is, does your definition of uh, um, surveillance include the concept of SUS, SUS surveillance as a site and source of resistance in uh, the Foucaultian perspective. So that's my first question to your conceptualization of the definition. My second question is, can you believe, or can you see that algorithmic literacy yeah, uh, can help citizens, as algorithmic li literacy in the, founded on the faith model, um, can help citizens to become less visible, and by extension, less uh, controlled by the GAFAM, the GAFAM ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, okay, yes, it's working. Uh, David, thank you so much for the presentation. It's really uh, excellent. Um, I have actually a comment and two questions. Uh, my comment is about uh, uh, your request to have a new metaphor. Uh, in the Arab world, we have a famous saying, which means the, the walls have ears. So notice here, instead of the seeing, instead of the sight uh, sense, uh, there is the emphasis on auditory sense in the Arab world. I think it comes from spying and, uh, you know, installing bugs in places. So it's a well-known thing. So if you want a new metaphor, maybe my metaphor will be state ear, state ears. Yep. So here you go. Uh, my, my question will be about um, uh, the horizontal uh, dimension. Uh, you focused on, in your presentation on the state as well as corporations uh, surveilling people. But I wonder about how people these days surveil other people. Like, for example, today we have the pro-Palestinian protest. We have a lot of people surveilling uh, the, uh, those uh, you know, in the rallies. I've seen this when I, when I go to the rallies uh, to support Gaza. I see people taking pictures. Some of them are actually... Probably, probably, you know, just for, there for surveillance. So I'm wondering about this new dimension, whether you have focused on it, the horizontal rather than the vertical. And uh, also in a non-political sense, uh, when it comes to surveillance, the paparazzi, can we say that, that that's another type of surveillance, but not political? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, and thank you so much for your interesting presentation. My name is Mitra Shamsi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Advanced Internet Studies, Bochum University. Uh, when it, it, it comes to the data protection, when uh, we hear about the cases of uh, you, uh, like a digital platform corporation using uh, citizens' data, it's, we see uh, uh, like emphasizing the role of the government to protect citizen data. But it seems at the same time that it opens up the space for this uh, government surveillance. I would like to uh, uh, find out about your uh, reflection on this regards of, the, uh, of this challenge. And at the same time, I would like to ask, when you uh, talk about necessary surveillance, who is uh, like legitimate to, to define this necessary surveillance? Uh, because I think it might like uh, legitimate the government to uh, like to, to control people at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you, over there. Um, hello, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is about... Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Amin Majidi Fard from Iran. Uh, my question is about uh, the visibility. Uh, in uh, Osef Bayat's theory, uh, we see the uh, visibility uh, is uh, about resistance uh, and is a form of resistance. What's the difference between uh, these two perspectives, uh, visibility as a form of resistance and uh, visibility is uh, as a tool for surveillance? Uh, and then, uh, visibility it shapes resistance and uh, when can help the surveillance state. Thank you. Uh, over there, please, then. Uh, yes, hello. Thanks, David, for this uh, lecture. I'm Ashraf Abu Musa, a PhD researcher at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, actually, my uh, main question about the information sharing between uh, governments and private sector. Sometimes, you know, uh, some practitioners believe that this is very important to decrease the level of crimes, the level of, uh, you know, security threats. And, you know, there's an argument uh, that some scholars and academics criticize this, uh, the level of surveillance, digital surveillance. You know, how can we uh, determine which information, which data, uh, that necessary for this uh, to be shared with governments and to be shared between governments and the private sector corporations. How can we know, I, I, do you feel that uh, this kind of paradox in this uh, context? Thank you so much. Thank you. Here's the Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Elaha Islamia and I'm coming from uh, Central European University. Um, my question is more about the, this, the metaphor of uh, eye of God and the, the need to reconsider uh, this metaphor. And uh, in fact, you talked uh, in your very last comment about this element of care that uh, exists in uh, uh, understanding surveillance. And uh, um, my question is um, actually related to uh, what Mitra asked, that uh, how, how can we conceptualize this, the need to protect to protect users' rights, for instance, and the, these kinds of movements that are happening in Europe, for instance, uh, or this, this can also be abused in contexts like, for instance, Iran, the, in which uh, protection uh, of users' uh, rights is basically uh, used as, as another form of uh, surveillance, and it's always justified by this element of uh, care that you talked about. And, uh, my question is like how how do you conceptualize this element of care and uh, how can we talk about uh, a new state that um, cares for uh, citizens and new forms of uh, governance that uh, might emerge? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Mm. <coughs> so, sorry. Good morning. I'm Mita Sotomenget and I work for European Digital Rights uh, Digital Rights Organizations in, in Europe. Um, I, I thank so much for your presentation. I, have, uh, I 
I can only concur with, with, with you when it comes to necessity, proportionality, and, and also legality. And when, the nation, when there's a blanket national exception, what should we do about that? Because that's what governments are doing. Israel is doing that, but also European governments are doing that. And my other question has to do with data retention. Because we keep speaking about how data flows and how data is, but there's, there's companies who are forced to actually keep the data also for national security purposes or for others. Because we can imagine data as something like movable, as you know, the idea of a cloud, whereas data is really material, right? Not just in environmental terms, but also in, in pri privacy data and da personal data breaches. So how does data retention work in this idea of, of surveillance? So the, the only safe data is the data that is destroyed, right? That would be my conceptualization. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Comments. So uh, yes, I guess we have ten minutes. Ten okay. minutes. Well, thank you for your great questions. Um, we could spend all week discussing these questions, but uh, they are great questions, and uh, I'm grateful for them. So the first question had to do with uh, surveillance or um, surveillance from below uh, of those who might be surveilling from above. And um, the, that concept was actually developed by a computer scientist, not a social scientist, uh, and someone who was concerned about the uh, what he thought of as the misuse of uh, new capacities for surveillance that did not allow for uh, a, a watching back um, or, or a watching from under, as it were. So that's where that uh, notion comes from. And um, as with a number of other ideas about how to combat surveillance that come from those within uh, computing science and uh, uh, algorithm building and so on and so forth. Um, what I often fear is that they're, they're somewhat limited, and here's a, a plea for more discussion between social scientists and computer scientists. Uh, very necessary in this field um, because often uh, those who are working in those fields are themselves um, that themselves have their work supported by uh, research grants and so on that come from corporations and they are frequently looking at it from a corporate perspective rather than one that starts with civil society for example uh, and there's also a tendency within those kinds of uh, responses to imagine that uh, somehow tech responses to surveillance or tech-based responses to surveillance are really going to uh, be able to make a difference. The problem with that is that frequently uh, those, to, those who are being recommended with tech solutions are uh, people who don't have a technical background, and therefore they're dependent upon those who are within the industries for whatever help they can give, and also dependent on a marketplace. And uh, you know, this applies, I think, to surveillance, uh, but also to other kind of tech solutions to um, surveillance situations. They may be good. You know, it, it may well be good to um, uh, have end-to-end -end encryption on your email account or, or whatever. And I'm not saying anything against that. The problem is it frequently involves, A, uh, te technological expertise, sometimes of a rather sophisticated kind, and two, it depends upon the ability to pay for that which is going to protect you from the uh, surveillance that you're concerned about. And that I find very problematic because then it is l much less of a, a public good
to be able to resist surveillance and something that's limited to folks who have either technological expertise, expertise or the funds to pay for that uh, protection. So I'm kind of making it a bigger question than you asked, but I, I do think it's really important that we think, think about public responses to surveillance, which is itself something now being provided by corporations in uh, cooperation with uh, government departments. Uh, you also asked about um, algorithmic literacy to help uh, folks become uh, less visible. Well, again, there are different ways of thinking about this. And uh, what I've just said will apply in some cases to the um, uh, question of algorithmic li li literacy. I think it's really important that uh, we try to expand our understanding of how the uh, technologies being used uh, actually operate. That I have no problem with. Uh, but again, you're, you're only going to find a limited number of people who are really willing and able to, to carry through with, uh, with that. Um, when I, I mentioned the name of Joy uh, Bualamwini, uh, and uh, I, I must say I admire the work that she is doing on algorithmic literacy and so on. But she herself is a computer scientist who has become more and more, you know, she talks with people in the social sciences. And it was she who founded the uh, Algorithmic Justice League in the US when in a very serious empirical study uh, published in one of the computing science journals, she showed definitively how that intersectional disadvantage uh, to, uh, to darker skinned female characters, it, it, systematic discrimination through the algorithmic uh, through the algorithm that, that had been built for that facial recognition system. Now, what she is doing is trying to not um, produce something that is going to cost people money or even require them to have more knowledge about algorithms, but rather to develop ways of what she calls uh, discovering together with civil society um, forms of... Um, resistance. Um, so that's how I approach that. I'm grateful for the uh, wolves having ears. Um, that's, uh, that's good. And of course, I mean, again, as a Westerner, uh, I'm familiar with the uh, many plays of William Shakespeare. And uh, Shakespearean plays are full of surveillance of all kinds, including an awful lot about the uh, oral um, the audio kind of uh, surveillance. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting example. But it's necessary when we talk about a metaphor, even the technical term is a metaphor, uh, when we realize that uh, surveillance is an optical um, concept that draws upon and includes all manner of uh, non-optical uh, aspects. And that, that is a fascinating discussion just in itself. Um, yes, the matter of horizontal surveillance and, uh, and people uh, surveilling each other. In my little book about cultures of surveillance, I spent a fair bit of time discussing that uh, uh, mutual surveillance that is made possible above all by the development of social media. And uh, looking at the various dimensions of that. And uh, several PhD students of mine have looked at, looked at exactly that question in different, from different cultural contexts. I think it's a, it's a critically important area for us to examine, not least because uh, it's often seen as, a, uh, uh, as an innocent practice to be watching, as it were, each other. Uh, it turns it into a, a game. It's kind of gamified. And uh, 
for myself, I find that problematic and questionable, especially because it's <laughs> some of the same um, uh, affordances of the new technologies that facilitate surveillance of a uh, coercive or exploitative kind, and the exploitation becomes as important as the carceral in the present situation. I mean, Foucault was primarily concerned with the carceral and the disciplinary, not with the uh, ways in which that, um, that, that broader uh, impact or possibility uh, comes into being. And so, yeah, I think it's a, a really important question for us to, to consider uh, that the same affordances allow us to gamify something that in other contexts is extremely uh, serious. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a and, and I also think it's a good way in for trying to help uh, in the kind of educational process of uh, thinking about surveillance, which is not just fun and not just a game uh, where it's very serious and has very serious uh, outcomes. Um, but of course, some of those outcomes become very serious online in all kinds of ways when it comes to um, uh, you know, everything from stalking to, yeah, all, all kinds of behaviors that um, are generally and rightly viewed as socially negative. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great one. And the paparazzi, um, yes, of course it's surveillance. <laughs> and, um, I, again, the, uh, the ways that that is uh, kind of shut off in relation to compartmentalized, I mean, uh, in the area of investigative journalism. Uh, again, I think we need to be asking bigger questions. How does that kind of behavior relate to the larger questions of surveillance and vice versa? Uh, I think all these things need to be brought into the open far more than they are. And uh, I was trying to suggest in my talk that we need to think not only in kind of social science terms, but also in literary terms. How are we helping people on a broader scale to understand? And what are the metaphors? And do the metaphors work in the way that we want them to work if we're going to uh, help expand the uh, understanding of what are very, very significant uh, modes of uh, uh, control? But you know, so often that's through very subtle things like nudging and, and so on. Uh, data protection um, and what is necessary surveillance. Um, I, on the one hand, I salute all agencies that are developed in order to try to uh, legally limit the spread of uh, surveillance in general, um, but citizen surveillance in, in particular. Um, and so, and, and I've worked with such agencies for very many years and had a great relationship with them too because there's a mutual learning to understand the niceties of uh, legal restrictions on the one hand by the social scientists who may not be aware of them. Uh, and, and likewise, from the point of view of those who are involved in those uh, agencies, uh, to understand the kind of social science background that, that helps put the whole thing in context. So I think there are some very fruitful relationships to be had there, and I have no doubt about it. What is insufficient, in my view, <laughs> is the uh, collaboration with civil society and uh, how we can encourage the agencies and the researchers, researchers both in computing sciences and in social sciences, to really talk together more. And I think that's something to plead for, and I'm delighted to see that uh, there are people here today who are uh, concerned with that like three-way 
uh, conversation, which I think is uh, exceedingly worthwhile. What is necessary surveillance? Um, well, at this point, we, um, we confront something that is a, a, a basic issue in surveillance studies as in any other field. Um, let me tell you about my most um, vociferous uh, opponents in this field. There are people who think that I am soft on surveillance because uh, I grant that some surveillance may be appropriate, protective, conducive to um, a social order where there is peace and equality, uh, and so on. So I do not take the view that all surveillance is necessarily objectionable and or carceral or necessarily exploitative or whatever. And so I take the view that um, there are possibilities for developing surveillance that are appropriate. And then you ask the question, well, how do you know that they're appropriate? Well, again, I don't think it's a matter of uh, lawmakers and public servants simply saying what is, we need to, what is appropriate or necessary. We need to be discussing with people who are ethicists. We need to be discussing with people who uh, are, as it were, those who are worst affected by negative forms of surveillance. So engage with those who are uh, the most vulnerable, the most likely to be damaged by. So for example, in Canada, uh, where settler colonialism is a very visible part of uh, not just our history but our present, um, it's really critical that those who have been systematically excluded by and negatively affected by um, surveillance in Canada should be those who are involved in the process of trying to not just mitigate the worst effects but also to, uh, as far as possible, turn things around so that those worst effects cannot happen. And in fact, those who are negatively uh, affected may have uh, more than ample opportunity to contribute to the rebuilding of what I think of as necessary surveillance. And it may be uh, public health surveillance, for example. Uh, it, it may be yeah, surveillance over uh, financial business and uh, the, the, the tracking of um, illegal forms of financial transfer, uh, all those kinds of things, it seems to me, are what I would think of as necessary to uh, civil, democratic, uh, open forms of government. So uh, there, I've laid my cards on the table. I don't believe that surveillance is always and uh, necessarily surveillance uh, negative and uh, carceral and exploitative and so on. I don't take that view. I think that there are aspects of surveillance that are uh, conducive to uh, human flourishing. And uh, and I happen to believe that human flourishing should be the largest of the aims that anyone who's concerned about uh, public matters like this uh, should have. That's just the, the biggest frame, and uh, I, that, that's where I stand. Uh, are we out of time? Yeah. OK, let me just say that. Um, yeah, there are, there are unanswered questions here. By all means, let's talk about them one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, yeah, they're, 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 great. they're great questions. It is curious to me, just to say one thing in uh, answer to the, just continuing where we were a moment ago. Um, it's very interesting to me 
that uh, looking at the eye of God notion in the uh, 21st century context, it is very, very negatively construed by whoever uses it. It tends to be a completely negative notion. If you look back to medieval times, as I mentioned in my talk, it's quite ambivalent. And there is a uh, kind of reciprocity between the notion of um, an all-seeing eye, because on the one hand, as I said, there is a notion of reassurance there, and on the other hand, there is a respect for the eye. And I, I haven't worked it out yet. I, I have a lot more thinking to do about it, but it, I, I find that an attractive balance between reassurance and respect that is not out of place in thinking of contemporary forms of surveillance. And whether you call it the eye of God or not, that kind of notion of being reassured by appropriate and necessary surveillance on the one hand, and having respect for appropriate limits to that surveillance when it clearly is overweening and negative, especially as it becomes increasingly negative on certain uh, groups in the population, which is exactly what is happening with uh, consumer corporations, platform companies, uh, having their data being used by governments, it just exacerbates and amplifies the already existing disadvantages within certain government departments that the data they are obtaining has come from corporations who are already uh, doing their own sorting, ranking, scoring of what we should be thinking of as citizens who do not start with those kinds of disadvantages of having been pre analyzed, pre-classed, pre-treated as if they were in some secondary uh, group. So I think that's kind of a critical thing that I want to say that relates to all of the last three questions. Um, there, I've laid my cards on the table more than I anticipated, but it's probably time for me to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. Uh, now we'll have 15 minutes uh, uh, coffee break, then we'll back to our sessions.